This episode is proudly supported by Powerhouse Parramatta. Powerhouse Parramatta will open in 2025. The new museum will be the largest in New South Wales and is determined to offer the very best in hospitality. Perhaps your business can be part of defining a food and beverage offering which is expected to cater to 2 million visitors a year. This incredible opportunity for operators includes retail food and beverage, in-house residential catering, events and other hospitality ventures, encapsulating the diversity of cuisines and cultures that make Western Sydney so exciting. Interested to learn more? Powerhouse invites food and beverage operators to a briefing on Tuesday 8th of August. For more information and to register for this exclusive briefing, go to powerhouse.com. All we did on the weekends was family barbecues. Everyone came around, it was family barbecues. And I think that's sort of like what Loft is, brings a lot of people, share, have fun, enjoy a drink, and enjoy some nice meals. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. After the lockdowns, regional areas boomed in Australia as people took the chance to escape their city lives. Destinations in more tropical climates experienced the best of it, and it allowed the local hospitality scenes to really flourish. But as we get back to normality, what are those regions like now? Juan Hernandez is the head chef of Loft Byron Bay. Juan, how are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Anthony. It's great to get you on the show. Uh, You're up in a beautiful part of Australia. How are things at the moment? Oh, it's fantastic. Um, Living in uh, the Northern uh, Rivers uh, region, it's such a beautiful place. Just the weather, um, people, uh, it's just great, you know. But the weather is just, oh, it's always steaming hot, cold in the morning and nice weather in the afternoon. You've got to love that. When we started to climb out of those lockdowns, it seemed like um, from afar that Byron was almost overpopulated with people getting out of the city. What, what was that period of time like? Yeah, like, I mean, like, um, it, it's funny you say that because uh, when it all happened, like, before it happened, Byron was all raving with people, hospitality was booming. Cafes were busy, restaurants were busy. We had numerous of chefs uh, floating about. A lot of the backpackers would come in and um, uh, work as well. And then COVID hit, and uh, just it went all it sort of went all pear shaped. You know, um, it's hard to explain. Um, you know, we everyone left. You know, and uh, all went away because they couldn't survive here. You know, the rent went up and it, it was it was quite tough, quite tough for a lot of people who weren't living or had a property here or renting here. It was quite hard for them because there was no work as well. On top of that, you know, uh, I think we closed for like three months, more, a little bit more than that, and uh, it, was, it was hard on everyone. Everyone changed careers. On top of that, and uh, things slowed down, but the restaurant kept surviving. Like a lot of chefs here started cooking at home, doing cooking meals for people. Everyone helped. That was a, that was one of the things. Everyone helped here. You know, people who couldn't afford food, they cooked for food for people. Um, it was it was good to watch. Like here was a community, it was a great community here. Everyone helped each other during those tough times. Which is which is great. As you climbed out of that, and you know the the region did boom with everyone sort of travelling and getting away from the city. Was it hard to manage with so many people having to sort of move away from from Byron at you know during those tough times? You know, was it tough with staff and managing that sort of influx of people? Well, uh, um, look, it was it was tough, but I think we sort of like adapted to what we had, and. Uh, yeah, so we, we just had to do our best, um, you know, work more as a team, you know, be more versatile. Um, and, yeah, um, yeah, that's all, that's all we, we could have done. Um, but then everyone moved away and, you know, it, just life goes on. you still got to do what you got to do, you know. 
You mentioned how um, vibrant the hospitality sector was before the pandemic, and it's and it's back on track now and a real destination. But are things a bit different? Is their approach a little bit different to sort of what the offering is in that sort of regional setting? I think yeah, it has it has changed a lot um, once once the doors got back opened. Um, you know how to manage. I mean, before all that, people. Just cut off. Yeah, Pe- people were were doing. Everyone stepped away from the hospitality, um, but they did their own thing. They started their own business. People, uh, a lot of the chefs started to do pop ups around here, which a lot of the people loved. You know, they went away uh, just down the road in a farm, little farmhouse, and they would just do pop ups. So that that was booming um, a lot around here in the region. You're at uh, Loft Byron Bay these days. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. Oh, Loft, it's uh, quite a fantastic uh, restaurant. Um, I, uh, it, it was funny how I got into that and uh, um, started working there as a casual chef, you know, doing – I took a break after a while. And, um, uh, you know, when you – because I was working at Beach – and I was working with Simon Palmer. We did, you know, amazing food. He left up to Brisbane. And, you know, when you get that burnt out, you just wanted to break. So, and then as soon as I took that break, I'll, I'll get a call from a friend going, oh, do you want to do some casual loft? I'm like, okay, you know. Oh, there goes my break. You know, I'll do casual shifts. Um, but then you know, do it on the weekends. And that it sort of like kept me going. You know, uh, I, I thought getting away the hospitality um, would would do me good, but uh, no, it didn't. Because then I got <laughs> I got I got into uh, the Northern River Seafood, the company there. The boys, oh, such an amazing group of people there. Um, it's a seafood in Ballina, um, doing wholesale, which took another broad. Uh, perspective on 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 everything, and it, it didn't even help me having a break because seeing all these seafood that comes from different areas, different places, how it's caught, and it's, and then on top of that, I was working at the loft restaurant and putting those fish onto the menu, and then it just kept going and going and going, and then it came to an opportunity when. Uh, the owner, Matt Hunt, goes, Juan, you're always happy here. You have a smile on your face. You make everyone laugh. You make, you're, you're, you're an inspiration to the team. We would like you to come on board and uh, become the head chef. And I took that opportunity. I only lasted eight months, mind you, this break, thinking that I was going to be something else, be a, fire, you know, a firefighter or a real estate agent but none of that happened and uh, got back in the kitchen and and it was like a spark. That place just put me in a different direction, loving food, uh, getting inspired. Um, The staff that I have at Loft Restaurant um, are on next level, amazing. They're young, but they're so passionate because they bring a lot of different things into the kitchen and they've never seen it. I explain to them, and they're like, "Oh, what is their lives lit up?" And the and the bonus thing about Loft, where what we do at Loft Restaurant is all shared meals, and that I sort of grew up in that sense, with you know my background, Chilean background, you know, um, all we did on the weekends was family barbecues. Everyone came around it was family barbecues, family barbecues. Every weekend, and I think that's sort of like what Loft is, brings a lot of people, shared, have fun, enjoy a drink, enjoy some nice meals, and uh, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. I'm glad you brought up uh, your Chilean background and sort of mentioned about when you were young. Take us back to there. Tell us a little bit about Chilean food, and is there, are there any sort of dishes or, that you remember fondly from when you were young? Yeah, um, I came, look, I was born 
in Chile, in Concepcion, when I was one, you know, and dad, dad uh, moved us to Australia and uh, took mum, took the whole family, and uh, he wanted a better lifestyle. But in saying that, mum brought all her, you know, cooking styles, what she was taught, and uh, my uncle had a bakery, a uh, small little bakery. It wasn't nothing special, but back in, in Concepcion, and taught me like different just the most common dishes were the empanadas that was something that we would have almost every weekend the sope pias um which is like it's like a little pastry but you fry it and you eat it and you can eat it with pebre which is like a uh, salsa verde mixed in and then when it's a cold winter's day mum will make a cazuela which is like a beef a nice beef soup oh and it's it's, it's 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 something that you grow up with, you know, every time. But then, in saying that, like we had relatives who um, live in the western suburbs, and they were Chileans as well. So they would just make empanadas, tot- uh, tortillas. Uh, we made a lot of bread as well. Ayuyas we made at home. Uh, to this day, I still make ayuyas, but not how my uncle used to do it. I still try to perfect that. Uh, <laughs> Oh my god! I try and try. I get close. Mum's like, "Oh, are you almost close?" And it's like, "Oh, you got to tell me, mum. You got to tell me." <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was good memories. Good memories. Uh, I cherish a lot, and I'm glad what mum's taught me our Spanish cuisine, um, the Chilean cuisine, which is which is more. It was more like home style. Um, it was nothing over the top. It's what they can, what can, what ingredient, ingredients they had. Um, I've had empanadas are something that most people in Australia would be familiar with. How do you, how do you make a great one, or is there one in the family that you can tell us about? That well, that's another thing. Like uh, to perfect it, how like oh my mum, did I do it right? Oh, you got there, you got there, and, and no, it's always no, nah, you're close, and then and then she tells me. Oh, you know what? Your father just made one, and it was pretty top notch. And I'm like, "Oh, thanks, mum. Thanks." Now, how am I going to beat that one? But uh, <laughs> it was not long ago. Uh, I went to mum's. Uh, mum lives in Newcastle. Uh, mum and dad, and uh, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make these sopa beers, and I'm going to try to make empanadas as well. Didn't have time to make empanadas, but I'll get to you on that one. I made sopa beers, pumpkin one. And these pumpkin were to die for. We ate it in two seconds. My brother was sending me messages from work. Please leave me some. Please leave me some. <laughs> oh, but then, uh, yeah, got home the other day, like not long ago, and uh, made these empanadas. I'm like, all right, I'm going to give this a whirl. I'll give this a whirl, and I'll give this a whirl. And the dough, it's all about the dough too because the inside you can do whatever you like. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the filling. The dough is the key, getting it nice and flaky, that flavour of the fat that you put in the flour. Um, and when I made it, I was like, I think, I, I think I've got it. I think I've got it. And then I send it to mum and mum goes, done. You've done it. So I affected my empanadas. Now I've got to take it that into the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how did that make you feel when you got that acknowledgement? Oh, just... I had goosebumps, you know, in my arms going, finally got it. Mum said it's right and it's good. And then mum's like, oh, can you deliver some now? <laughs> it's like, uh, you live in Newcastle. I think by the time it gets there. What, when did you first start to think about a potential career as a chef? Where did, where did it all start for you? Oh, it's, it's funny, funny with that because um, when I finished, well, I look, I was involved in food all my life. Never thought I was going to be a chef. You know, I lived in the western suburbs um, and in Fairfield and I had a lot of multicultural friends like uh, Vietnamese, Cambodian, Lebanese, Greek, uh, Croatian, you know, and uh, growing up, you know, going to their house, seeing their family, what they're making, always smelling, looking, oh, what's your mum making? They would explain, and you know, I, I was always interested, always interested, but didn't have that 
I'm going to be a chef. And then mum's like, uh, you know, it was year 12, we're 11 and 12, did um, home, ec- home economics and uh, did that. Didn't think of anything and teacher would go like, oh, what, what do you know how to cook? Oh, I can cook noodles and boiled eggs and scrambled eggs. Is that good? And yeah, oh, yeah, 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 that's good. <laughs> um, and then a friend of mine said, oh, why don't you uh, – you know, do an electrician and uh, talk to my dad, you know, my dad, like, he's not going to go to uni because my dad was always, you need to study, you need to study, you need to study, you need to study, you need to do well. And I knew straight away it wasn't for me, you know. I knew I wasn't going to go to uni. I knew I wasn't going to do this. So I started doing an electrician with a friend and that went pear shape. Um, it was good, and then I got left in the roof um, for like three hours. Um, it was, uh, I was doing the roofing, the fire alarms for Peter Shamarisel, and got left there. And I'm like, oh, okay, is this how it is? And that's been going on for a while. I thought that was funny, and but I sort of like didn't like it. And um, then that you know I had a nice family meeting and. Dad's like, why don't you try cooking? I'm like, yeah, but what if, no, oh, it's going to be hard. You know, <laughs> nah. And then mum's like, you always cook at home. Because mum, I oh, used to cook these mean, mean scrambled eggs, you know, like get everything out of the cupboard, chop this, chop that, chop this, and made my own scrambled eggs. And everyone's like, oh, make me some. It's like, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> that was my highlight of my cooking Cooking uh, when I was a kid, doing these awesome uh, scrambled eggs, different flavoured scrambled eggs. And, uh, yeah, then got a job at the uh, General Burke Hotel. That was my first cooking job in Parramatta. And, wow, that was an eye-opener on food, how food was delivered, how everyone worked. Everyone worked as a team. How everyone had different sections. It, it was something that I've never seen before. You know, it's it, it's just mind blowing. And uh, you had to talk to people. You know, everything was new. Um, and yeah, that's where I started. I started liking. But then one of the uh, one of my mates there goes off oh, one. You know, you, 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 you're good at doing – like, he saw something. He didn't – he saw something in me on what I was doing. And he goes, why don't you move to Sydney? I'm like, nah, nah, Sydney's a long, long, long way. I didn't have a car. Mum and Dad used to drive me. Um, yeah, Dad Dad would, like, sleep on – out. like, he, he, Dad would do night shifts. Um, he would wait for me at the end of the night. And and it got to a point where he was like, you know, you've got to get your license. You got to you got to get it sorted. You know, you, I can't keep doing this. So did that, and he stopped, you know, uh, picking me up <laughs> overnight. Um, and then I got a job at GPO, my first fine dining job. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was my highlight. I think I'm never, ever going to forget the people I worked with at GPO. I think um, at that time, Bank Hotel, Bank Restaurant, sorry, was part of the group and I didn't even know. Um, I found out right towards the end and I'm like, oh, my God, look at this shit. But having I had Daryl Felstate as my head chef at GPO. Yeah. I he taught me a lot on the space of what two three two years I was there with him and the chefs there it was just a different going to a pub then going to post and prime was a different ball game and that made my eyes open even more it was like wow is this what food is about not just, but top ingredients, how to cook it, where they get it from, what they put it onto the plate, how it looks on the plate. That was just, yeah, I, I will never forget that, that part of my life. 
And, then, and then there was one, I remember there working at G, uh, Post and I got a phone call from, uh, well, I got told by the chef, you have to run uh, bank or I think it was wine, but I ran out of oysters. They sent me up to uh, <laughs> drop some oysters off. And they're like, oh, come and work here, come and work here. I'm like, oh, no, no, I've got to go back down. I've <laughs> got to go back down. <laughs> Uh, it was good times, good times at that place. Well, after that experience, it really opened your eyes to the potential in the food world. Where, where did that take you after that? Well, um, it took me, like, I moved on and I went to uh, Reds at the Rocks where Jeff Turnbull was there. Yeah. Um, that was another, I went from, GPO to there, just the food that he was doing. But at that time, it was the restaurant, and plus we were doing a lot of catering. Um, well, not catering, function work uh, for like 100, 200 people that came from uh, the cruises. They will come up and we would cater for them and, uh, yeah, learn a lot from Jeff um, Turnbull. And then, uh, then I left there and uh, – Went to Parramatta again to Courtney's Brasserie. Wow. That's a flashback. That was – Courtney's Brasserie was a, another place in Parramatta where the chef Paul Cooper taught me a lot of things. Being yourself, don't mix any flavours around, too many flavours, be original. If you do one style, like if you're doing Japanese, stick with Japanese food. You're doing Middle Eastern food, stick with Middle Eastern food. And that stuck by me through my whole career, you know. I, and, and funny you say that, like, I've been learning different styles. And this is what created me to be different and what I do at Loft as well. You spent a fair bit of your time sort of out of Sydney as well in your career in various places like um, Nelson Bay and obviously Byron as well. What sort of start, what started that sort of move away from the city and to, to work in the regions like that? Um, I think because at that time, Dad, well, Mum and Dad moved up to Nelson Bay and uh, we've been brought up very family orientated. Um, you know, stick with a family, always with a family, always with a brother and sister. And I wanted to be close to my my parents and my brother and sister and um, ended up moving up to Nelson Bay. And uh, that was uh, great until I couldn't live with my parents. Because <laughs> it's funny because um, you've been away from home for such a long time, you come back home and, and, and mum will go, where are you going? You have to be home by this time. Dinner's going to be ready at the table. You need to be home. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't deal with that anymore. <laughs> I was like, I think, I think I'm old enough where I can make my own decisions and do everything. But mum is mum. Dad is dad. You know, you as, as, as always a kid, you know, and I love him to death. But I had to move away from Nelson Bay and go to, <laughs> and, and go to Newcastle. So I stayed in Newcastle. And uh, that was another great experience too. Got myself uh, a job at the engine room uh, with the honeysuckle and uh, started uh, doing breakfast and dinner, lunch and dinner. And uh, it was quite a unique place. Learn a lot there. And I think it was my first head chef's position too. Um, that was an eye opener as well. Losing a lot of staff. How do I handle it? How do I do things? And uh, you, le you le through all your career for your chefing, you, you learn to adapt. Okay, it's it's okay. The staff have left. How do we deal with it? Who do you have to work with? How can you manage it? How can we get the best out of that person? And then Simon Palmer comes along, and he was my right hand man uh, while I was the he running running the show, and he was just an apprentice. Um, <laughs> oh, we oh, they were they were really good times. They were really good times, and 
you know, we just had learned to adapt and he was just just learning and, and I had to show him, okay, this is what we have to do, just listen to my voice, this is this, chop it like this, do it like this, do it like this and we end up doing uh, nice nice food and execute it really well and uh, no one knew we had these flaws, um, you know, start we had no staff, it's hard to get chefs, no one knew that because we made sure we didn't pass that across to the front of the house, you know. It was always, we leave it in the kitchen, stays in the kitchen, and we work to the best what we can and what we had. Tell us about your time at Bacchus Restaurant in Newcastle. Yeah, and then after after uh, Andrew Room, I got a position at Bacchus, which was a nice venue, and uh, we were awarded, uh, got our first chef's hat, which is amazing. Um, that was an eye opener. Just how things we we've done, um, the food, the style was amazing. And uh, back again, I had no chefs. And then Simon comes along again, <laughs> and we were reunited again. And uh, yeah, we just did amazing food and taught him the same thing. This is how we do it, and we executed. Uh, uh, the food that we had to do um, and uh, made it really special. And it's amazing how, like, these incidents, you make a lot of good friends and friends that uh, they're chefing friends that stick by you no matter what. Um, we always had a saying, you know, always treat your friends correctly because you never know down the line that you could um, work with them once again, you know. You've, you've been up in the Northern Rivers for a little under a decade now. What what, what triggered the move up there? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was quite uh, – it was on holiday. Um, went up uh, with my ex-girlfriend and uh, she's like, oh, there's a few restaurants around here, or lovely restaurants, cafes. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's very nice. And she goes, well, what do you apply a job here? I'm like, oh. But what if I get one straight away and I have to move up here? <laughs> and funny enough, I applied at Utopia in Bangalore and five, what, maybe three hours later, I got a phone call. Can you come for an interview? And I got the job and I ended up here in the Northern Rivers. <laughs> so that, yeah. Um, but I've always liked Byron. Um, I, it's, we came here for holiday and the beach is beautiful. Just the, the vibe, the lifestyle is great. And not knowing what Byron would bring to me um, with just the produce was just next level. You've been involved with many venues since moving there. Tell us about how your cooking has changed and and the produce that you've had those connections with. Well, yeah, um, I, when I was head chef at Utopia, um, then Carl and Katrina came along and they were just a few shops down from where I was working. Then. That was like, oh, my God, Katrina and Carl. Oh, it, was, it was like, you know, it, it's, it's like the chefs that you've grown up with and you're like, oh, they're in the area. So I used to come down there say hello, how are you going, always talk to them. And uh, then I moved on and they had co- uh, a barista there that opened up a restaurant down in Ballina. And I said, oh, when you go down there? And it was called the General, uh, Bell General. So the Bell General was a cafe in Shelley Beach and what their philosophy was gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free. That, I was like, oh, my God, okay, this is different. How am I going to do this? Because it changes your whole perspective of food. Changes Because everything's made, what, sugar, butter, duck fat, everything. You know, that's where the flavor. But I had to change my style to adapt to what their philosophy was. And it took a while but on top of that, seeing what products I had to use to make it taste right, look right, and execute it well. And 
it, it and, and once I adapted, it was it was amazing. And then uh, after that, it's, it's just made me a changed person in how I cook things. And also it, by learning all that also taught me how to eat properly as well. You know, you don't have to eat KFC, McDonald's, which I do sometimes. That's a sneak one. <laughs> That's all my days off. Uh, um, but, you know, eat, eating right. And then and the, the, the girls taught me, you know, to go to the farmer's market, have a look there. See what's going on. See what the farmers are doing. See what they're bringing, and started doing that. Started developing, but it wasn't wasn't much. I wasn't involved as much as what I wanted to be then. And uh, then I got a, a head chef position because I was missing the restaurant side of it, a, a balcony, and that was that was good head chef position. We did breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then I started putting a lot of things into it. What I used to do, the dietaries, everything. It, it, it was good. It was really good. And then Nathan Tillett rang me up. And he was part of the GPO group when I was working as an apprentice. Yeah. <laughs> A blast from the past. And that's, that's what I always say, you know, you got to – Always try to be good for you, with your chefs, you know, because you never know where you're going to end up with. And uh, he goes to me, Juan, I've got something for you. And I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever. This is going to New Year's Eve too. Um, I'm like, yeah, nah, nah. He goes, we'll talk later after. And he rang me up again. He goes, come and meet me at Seagulls Club. So, again, outside the box, RSL Club. I don't know what to do. How do I do it? This is we're talking about doing five, six, seven hundred people, then cater and then doing function work for a thousand. Um, we had another ballroom. We did the police ball. We did a couple of uh, wedding events. You know, a thousand, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm used to doing only like twenty, thirty, forty. That's about it. And you learn to adapt and uh, learn how, what the customer wanted, what they can afford. And, and I was producing that with my, um, the gluten-free, dairy-free style as well. And people loved it. And uh, that was an, another great adventure. Then I got to do some uh, cooking competitions for the Seagulls Club. Because Seagulls Club was involved with the uh, North Collective and got to see the venues. Oh, that was that was amazing how big they are, how they operate and, and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, and, <laughs> and then after working with Nathan, like Nathan taught me a lot how to run a big business um, and also be simple. Don't put too much on the plate. Don't make it hard for yourself because the numbers that you're doing, you need to, one, do good food, good flavours, but easy to execute. That was another thing he taught me. And, and, and it's great and, and, and costings as well because, you know, it's not just – it's everyone can cook, but how can you cost it? How much? How to do this? How to do that? Um, and then you can cook it. Cooking's easy. It's, it's, it's the back end and learning that made me another eye open as well, which is good. And uh, yeah. And then, <laughs> then I got a phone call. This is talking three years later, got a phone call. Simon Palmer rang me up and I'm like, hello. He goes, yeah, uh, I'm getting a job in Byron. I'm like, okay, do you want to come work for me? <laughs> I'm like, uh, okay, sure. When's this? Oh, in a few months I'll be there. I'm like, okay. And that's when I got a job at Beach Byron Bay with Simon Palmer again. Wow. wow. That was amazing. That took my food to a different perspective. Do you have an example of the food that you were doing there and, and how different it was? Um, he was – Getting local produce, making the product speak for itself. 
you know, not putting too many elements on a dish or putting just, you know, uh, it's, it's, and the chefs that we had there were so talented uh, and everyone backed each other with everything. Uh, we had a real tight kitchen, uh, in, meaning tight as in like our friendship. We had a good friendship and good chef uh, worth ethic, which was next level. No one, everyone helped each other, which was great. Um, and yeah, we just, he just used a lot of local products around the region and he just create a dish and I'll be like, holy smokes. What did I learn? What did I think of that? He's what made me now what I am. And gave me that big spark at Loft to use a lot of local produce. Let the product speak for itself. Tell us a little bit about the food there at Loft. Is there a dish or two that you could take us through that sort of exemplifies your approach? Yeah, well, there's one that I got there. Well, um, we've got uh, a Australian Bay lobster. Uh, so it's a, um, it's a farm in Tweed. So we grabbed, so it's a more made bug. We, I split it open and I make a squid ink linguine and uh, I put it with uh, a seaweed butter that I made um, and uh, shallots, garlic, and put some sea herbs on top of it. And how I got that was because what I did with Simon. Um, the products that we're using, I'm like, oh, my God, there's a product up there. We can make it down here. Pasta goes well with seaweed butter. Oh, it's to die for. Um, uh, we did a lot of passes there. We had uh, a lot of Italians in the in the kitchen as well, and they taught me a lot of passes, and I've been creating that into loft as well making my own pasta there with a little pasta machine. Still haven't got a big one yet, but it's coming. <laughs> you gotta, you got to use what you got to use. Um, um, yeah, so the gnocchi, fresh gnocchi. I've done gnocchi there. Um, just a simple bird long uh, house ricotta, uh, nice sage. And, and, and people love it. And, and that's what I think people like is simple but tasty food, food that they know, but obviously they can't do it at home. Um, that's what I try to do at Loft. Well, you've become a real sort of voice of the region there um, in a very quick time as well. What do you love about what you do? <sighs> you know, I, it's, I've always loved being a chef more now as ever, just a spark um, having all these versatile ingredients, um, people I work with that make you, um, that help you as well, showing you different things, growing at the same time, have an understanding family. I think the big the big thing is having understandable family. My wife, um, she's really understandable how passionate I am about food. Um, always back me up with everything I, I do here. In the, uh, with everything, going to the markets, uh, getting fruit and veg, uh, talking to suppliers. She's always been there, taking my boys with me to the farmers market. Mind you, when I take him to the farmer's market, it's always a jam donut and a smoothie. Uh, after showing him different things, that's there. <laughs> that's a, look, look, look what we can get. But he wants his strawberry jam, uh, donut and a smoothie. Um, <laughs> um, but I've always introduced and, – and it just gets – I keep learning. That's, that's another thing. I'm always learning. I'm always learning. If I'm not sure, I read a book about it. I Google it. I see how to make it, where you can get it. Why is it done? If not, I look at a chef's profile, see what they're doing. Be up to date 
to what they do. Um, I'm even going back to TAFE. Um, I want to do a, a petitionary course. I know how to do my basic petitionary, but I want to get better at it. I want to keep learning and learning and, 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 and to be the best what I can do and to bring it to loft. That's uh, – it's just as – I just love cooking. I think it's the lifestyle that's in there. You know, I tried to move. I tried to change, get back in the kitchen, and I love it. Well, it's been an absolute honour to catch up with you today just to hear a part of your story and look forward to seeing what you do from here on. Um, please keep in touch and we'll catch up again soon. Yeah, thanks, thanks Anthony. Thanks for having me. And, uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au and be well.